Hello everyone. Welcome to day two of JuliaCon 2021. A couple of notes before we begin today's session. We request you all to join us on the web app and if you have not joined the conference chat yet, please join us on Discord for the same. It is a friendly reminder that all spaces of JuliaCon 2021 are governed by a code of conduct and we request all participants to adhere to it. Let us begin then. I would now like to invite Dr. Jeff Bezinson, Ken Fisher, Dr. Viral Shah, and Stefan Karp Karpinski to discuss the state of Julia in 2021. Dr. Bezinson, Dr. Shah, and Stefan are the co-creators of Julia, and Keno is famous for many amazing Julia packages, as well as porting Julia to Windows while he was still in high school. Just a reminder about the time limit. 40 minutes for the talk with about five minutes for the questions. The audience can ask questions on Discord on the green channel. Whenever you are ready, guys. OK, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, everyone, uh, for virtually attending JuliaCon. Uh, so this is a talk we try to do pretty much every year to just review where we've been, where we are, and where we're going uh, with the language and sort of core features uh, of the system and the state of the ecosystem and try to just pull back and take an overall view of, of what's going on uh, with the language and ecosystem. Uh, notably, that gets increasingly difficult to do. Uh, there is more stuff going on all the time. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff happening that unfortunately I'm not aware of. Uh, so th this gets harder and harder. Uh, so all of this reflects uh, work by a lot of people, uh, an increasing number of people uh, and there's, in every year, there's also going to be more stuff that we can't even fit into this because there's too much stuff going on. Uh, but so this is just us trying to do our best to, uh, you know, assess things uh, from the perspective of the sort of core language development and just how we see things. Uh, so here we go. Uh, one thing that's becoming an annual tradition uh, for me, at least, is to talk about multi-threading. Multi-threading is a really big thing. Um, We've been working on it. A couple of years ago, uh, we announced the new threading system that we've been uh, enjoying using since then, but the work on that has been ongoing. There's still a lot of stuff to do. Uh, so let's see. So here is a list of sort of some recent items in our uh, roadmap for the threading runtime uh, with checks on things that are done and everything else is kind of not done. Uh, the yellow checks are things that are sort of done. So like we have some uh, thread safety items. Uh, there, there was a long list in the past of things we had to make thread safe. There's too many to put on the slide, uh, but we did those in the past. Uh, so this is just kind of the, the more recent items. Uh, and the green, the green ones are done, the yellow ones. So like a, we, we recently uh, made the distributed library and package loading mostly thread safe, but those uh, seem to have maybe some problems. So they're, they're not 100% yet. Uh, but we do have at least PRs for them. Uh, so those are yellow. Uh, work on the memory model basically consists of annotating our loads and stores with the right memory orderings and uh, going through code gen and figuring out what to tell LVM uh, about the semantics of all of our loads and stores. And we've done a lot of that, but it's probably, again, probably not 100%. Uh, so that gets a yellow check. Uh, we did in the past year. Uh, we added the uh, reproducible parallel RNG, which is a pretty cool feature. Uh, we now allow tasks to migrate between threads while they're running, which was a limitation for a while that's uh, it's lifted now, which is really nice. Uh, and there's also a gigantic new uh, primitive set of functionality in the language to support atomic operations. And uh, Jameson has a talk about that tomorrow. So uh, if you're curious about that, you should definitely check that out. That is all of uh, his work. Uh, we did a whole working group to come up with a design, uh, and he implemented that, and he drove that. It's one of the big new, uh, uh, biggest new sets of uh, kind of core functionality uh, to be added to the language recently. Uh, and then there are just a bunch more items left on here. Uh, so you can see mostly the performance things we haven't addressed yet. Uh, so you can tell we've kind of prioritized the correctness and, and uh, features that we need over just optimizing things. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to get to some of that the next year. Uh, and this, uh, Valentin started working on the GC state transitions, which will allow the 
GC to run in parallel with other code more often. Uh, so he started working on that, which is exciting. Um, and that's uh, that's where we are with threads. I think it's I think it's going pretty well. All right, and now similarly for the compiler. So in the in the compiler, we are at a kind of interesting place. Uh, I, I would say in some ways this year we hit a little bit of a plateau. We've uh, we've kind of done uh, we've gotten a lot of the sort of low hanging fruit, uh, and this year there was a lot of I think paying of technical debt, uh, and we've run up against some of the more difficult problems that we can't just solve you know easily, and they're going to take a longer time to address. Uh, and also, and increasingly, things have uh, moved in a slightly different direction, which Ken is going to talk about. Um, but we have done a bunch of things this year. So we, ha we have a, we sped up some of the method insertion uh, algorithm, uh, which makes using faster. So generally, when you type using uh, for a package and load it for the first time, that has been sped up pretty significantly, uh, which is nice. Uh, unfortunately, the compile time component of say time to first plot has not really changed much over the past year. That's more or less the same, uh, but using is significantly faster. Um, there are a lot of small improvements we did. So I went back to the slides from last year and I where I looked at uh, the number of merged PRs with the latency label and it was 66 and now it is 124. So that's a nice uh, steady progress. I guess we do about 60 latency related PRs per year. So that's that's cool. Uh, moving forward, uh, and the uh, the group of people working on the compiler, I think, has expanded, which is really nice. In particular, uh, Shuhei has been uh, doing a lot of the development work there. Uh, he landed a lot of really nice improvements to inference, uh, improving uh, generally improving the precision uh, and improving the kinds of things we can infer. Uh, you know, like for example, uh, if you have an if statement that says, you know, if is a x t. Uh, we can infer after that that x is a t, uh, but if you wrap that in a function, we couldn't infer that anymore. And he fixed that so that you can you can wrap uh, predicates and it will still propagate that information uh, back out uh, of the function. So that was a really nice improvement and a bunch of other uh, precision uh, inference precision improvements. Uh, and also uh, another a, a big uh, locus of work. Uh, on inference stuff that might have gone into base Julia but didn't make it in is actually happening in jet.jl, uh, Shuhei's package. So uh, that's also well, a lot. A lot of work is going uh, into that. So if you want to better static analysis uh, of your code, you should check out jet.jl uh, because that's where that work is kind of happening. Uh, lots of bug fixes. We put a, a big project into fixing some of the intermittent. Uh, CI failures that were plaguing the project, so that took quite a bit of time. Uh, so as I said, paying a little bit of uh, technical debt. Uh, we have a bunch of our roadmap items in the compiler are still to do. We just So a lot of these are the same as, as last year. We just unfortunately haven't done them yet. Uh, so kind of the bigger latency-related projects, uh, like more staging in the JIT, possibly caching code, uh, other algorithmic speedups still on our list, uh, just haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, so latency, of course, is the one area of work. Uh, the next area of work uh, that we are concerned about uh, is essentially being able to build uh, build artifacts, like create binaries, essentially, uh, which is something Julia is not that good at yet. Uh, so the, the, the artifact we can create now is basically system images. That's basically the thing we can uh, spit out uh, but system images take a pretty long time to build. Uh, it's not very convenient. So we want to basically make it faster and easier to build system images uh, so you can use them more, uh, which of course is useful for reducing uh, reducing the load time and time to first plot because you can start a Julia session that basically has everything uh, you need already loaded. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and, but then another area of work would be increasing the number of uh, kinds of build artifacts that we can produce. So think, things, hopefully things other than just system images. Uh, and uh, we, are, we have a plan to uh, be able to separate the LLVM and CodeGen component uh, from the Julia runtime because it's a very large dependency. Uh, so for people who want to deploy uh, smaller footprint binaries, 
uh, you would be able to remove uh, that dependency. And uh, aside from outside of that, the Julia runtime is actually pretty small. It's probably no more than maybe a megabyte uh, without uh, the code generation abilities. Uh, so that would significantly reduce uh, the footprint of a deployed binary if you don't need to compile at runtime. Uh, so that's something we're planning to do. Uh, additionally, uh, we're planning to be able to strip debug info and metadata and IR uh, out of build artifacts so you can make more of a you know compact deployable binary. Uh, there's some work on tree shaking. Uh, I've actually done some experiments about it, uh, but I haven't gone through to anything uh, that's sort of uh, PRable, uh, but hopefully uh, I'll get back to that. Uh, and then also, again, this is another item that was that was on the list last year, uh, but not much has happened, uh, which is adding some proper language support for separate compilation. So you can produce uh, multiple, say, libraries uh, and link them together in a kind of native Julia way. Uh, I've done a lot of thinking about that. Other people have done a lot of thinking about it. Uh, I think we haven't done any work on it, unfortunately, but I think uh, pretty soon, uh, I'd like to maybe start up a, a working group to discuss through uh, some designs and try to try to really get that going. Uh, the other thing we think we need to do is, is start putting some more advanced uh, array optimizations uh, into the compiler. Is one thing that we're you know we're we're pretty good at scalar optimizations, uh, but for things like eliminating array allocations, we don't really do that very much, uh, and that's something we really need at this point. Uh, so that's something else that's uh, very much on our list. Uh, and then we also need to do a bunch of GC performance work. People have been increasingly hitting uh, kind of speed bumps in GC behavior. Um, and uh, as, as I said, uh, the, other, the other big one is that, uh, you know, Julia is so flexible that uh, a large amount of experimentation has happened over time uh, in things that would normally be part of a compiler, uh, but people have been doing in packages, um, essentially various uh, Compiler uh, alternate code transformations or compiler plugins uh, like Cassette, which you know gives a general way to transform code, uh, or automatic differentiation, which differentiates code. People have uh, experimented with or, or uh, you know or uh, doing uh, symbolic optimizations uh, in some of the symbolic packages. So a lot of kind of compiler optimization type of experimentation uh, has happened in packages in Julia, which is very cool uh, and. I think a little bit unique. I think there's probably more of that in the Julia world than in, in most languages. Um, but there is in fact so much of that happening that we need to uh, start thinking very seriously about kind of compiler APIs and extensibility um, so that we can properly support uh, you know, that activity uh, and, and keep, that, uh, keep that going uh, and make it much more productive to do these kinds of uh, uh, custom uh, compiler uh, passes and plugins externally uh, so that is actually a, a big uh, a big area of focus right now, uh, which is exactly what uh, Ken is going to talk about. All right, uh, hi everybody. Uh, sorry for the uh, canceled diffractor talk earlier. I'll talk about it only very briefly, but I'll hopefully get an opportunity to uh, make that up to you all um, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, what I want to talk about uh, briefly in this talk, though, is um, what I think is some of the most exciting um, new developments that are happening in the Julia language right now. Um, and this is, is, isn't really something new. Uh, I, in particular, and others have been trying to push this for several years, but we had so many other things going on that we never really got around to doing it. And uh, that topic is how do we extend uh, how, how do we make it possible for people to extend the compiler in such a way um, as they would uh, extend libraries in Julia? So uh, if you will remember my talk from CGO uh, two years ago, uh, I talked a lot about automatic differentiation, which was sort of the, the main takeaway of that talk. But something I said at the very beginning is that I think uh, there's this dichotomy that we have where, on the one hand, we have composability of libraries, which in Julia I basically consider solved with multiple dispatch. I mean, everybody in the Julia world you know, knows the experience of, oh, I take a differential equation solvent, I put measurements on it, and maybe I throw in some symbolics, and maybe I run it on a GPU array, and everything works great. And that's sort of this like magical composability of um, numerical libraries, array libraries, you know, plotting libraries, all kinds of mathematical libraries uh, that we have in Julia and that are enabled by multiple dispatch to some extent. However, um, 
the same is not true for various sorts of compiler transformations that people have been wanting to do and uh, wanting to do increasingly more. So what do I mean by compiler transformations? I mean things like automatic differentiation, um, various sorts of um, fancy uh, optimization techniques. So whether it's uh, you know custom domain specific optimizers for say linear algebra, um, as we're seeing in the ML world a lot, uh, whether it's you know plugging in uh, something like an eGraph based optimizer. If you've seen Alessandro's work on metatheory.jl, you know that's something very exciting that you know we'd like to be able to take advantage of. Um, uh, and you know wh whether it's uh, things like uh, the uh, quantum computing compiler that the Yaro people are working on, uh, whether it's things like Turing, these are all operations that are not really libraries in the traditional sense, but rather they are, um, are operations that operate on the code of the program that you pass in. And we don't really have a good answer um, yet for composability of these various um, libraries. So if you want to you know, run uh, AD and want to run it, you know, use metatheory.gl to write a custom array optimizer and then, you know, split it into classical and quantum parts and run the classical parts on a GPU, it, you can't really do that right now um, because each of these are sort of uh, separate um, separate items and separate packages that don't really work together. So something we've been uh, thinking about quite a bit is how do we uh, provide abstractions in the compiler to A, let people uh, reuse what we have in the compiler, and B, let people build new things. Uh, so we've been making a little bit of progress on that, but we're by no means done. So uh, let me briefly survey um, what we have done. So um, in uh, 1.6, we added an interface to the compiler called Abstract Interpreter. Um, basically, the way to think of Abstract Interpreter is that it parameterizes the entire compilation pipeline and lets people uh, hook in into various places and just uh, completely replace um, what that part of the compiler does. And you know that's useful by itself, but part of this work of uh, creating abstract interpreter was actually factoring out a lot of the internal pieces um, into much more uh, standalone and discrete pieces. So uh, the caching logic has been cleaned up, uh, the method table look, uh, uh, lookup logic has been cleaned up, um, and because it's uh, cleaned up now, it's it's much easier for people to plug in and uh, replace those pieces for custom operations. Um, so as an example of that, um, as of 1.6, a GPU compiler sits on top of uh, abstract interpreter, making use of the capability to replace uh, method tables, because some GPU um, uh, functions have different code. Um, Cthulhu sits on top of uh, abstract interpreter, making use of sort of the capability to plug in custom inference and get out inference remarks, um, most notably JET. Uh, sits on top of abstract interpreter and was <coughs> obviously mentioned earlier. And then abstract interpreter is also quite useful um, to uh, prototype um, other sorts of compiler plugins. So a lot of the diffractor prototyping um, has been done using abstract interpreter. Um, so you know that was a lot of work. Elliot started it originally. Um, uh, Jameson did a huge amount of the reviewing on this, and I pushed it forward. But it's not really not really what we need to solve this composability challenge yet. Because it still basically just lets you wholesale replace the compiler plot, uh, uh, pipeline, but doesn't really, um, doesn't really solve um, composability. You, know, you, you can, of course, build your own compiler using abstract interpreter that then is composable, but abstract interpreter by itself doesn't solve it. Um, and more, more, of a, more than that, it basically exposes the raw compiler APIs, um, so it's also quite unstable. So uh, now that we have abstract interpreter and it's working well, what we're looking at is building some reusable pieces that will allow people to build higher level things. Um, so uh, one thing I want to highlight there is um, opaque closures. So um, you know, just a, the brief three minute, what is opaque closures? Um, well, consider a closure that allocates an array and then or consider a function that allocates an array and returns a closure that uh, just queries some property of the array. In this case, uh, this closure should always return true because all the closure asks is, is this an array? However, 
um, because of Julia's semantics, we can't actually create a closure that just always returns true here. And that is for two reasons. Uh, one is that um, uh, we might redefine methods later. And if we redefine a method to no longer just return true, then we need to know what the original array was in order to be able to compute that. Uh, so even though sort of when the function was executed, it looked like the closure was always going to return true, because of method redefinition, that's actually not true. And then the second uh, reason is that closure is actually just semantically lowered structs. So it is actually possible to take capture fields out of uh, closures. So um, uh, you can recover any anything that was semantically captured. You can recover from a closure object, um, even if you know it isn't actually needed to compute the um, uh, to result of the closure. Uh, so this you know this imposes uh, significant barriers to uh, optimization, and okay. yeah. So this this imposes significant um, barriers to optimization, and in particular, it's it's quite prohibitive for a number of um, uh, compiler plugins that we want to build on top, um, because this this sort of restriction of having to specify the closure lists uh, restricts us on the kinds of optimizations that are legal to do at optimization time. Because basically, uh, with a closure, you have to decide at lowering time what are all the things that are going to be in this closure. But uh, for a lot of transformations, you won't know that until um, optimization time. So uh, an exciting development that has go gone um, into um, uh, into 1.7 is uh, is opaque closures. And to the user, opaque closures look a lot like regular closures, um, except that they uh, capture the world age at creation. Uh, the list of captures is not semantically fixed. And what I mean by that is in our original example where we had uh, this array that we were allocating and then capturing, um, if at creation time the optimizer is able to prove that that closure will always return true, it is allowed to delete the allocation of that array and just create a closure that always returns true. And uh, th these are sort of the uh, optimization uh, privileges that opaque, uh, opaque closures give you. Um, uh, so th they're very useful uh, in combination with compiler transforms that you know do this kind of uh, split code gen where they have a, a you know a, something that they run and then some code that they need to run later. Um, and uh, AD is an obvious example of this. So Diffractor uses this heavily. Um, and uh, something I want to point out is that opaque closures aren't actually restricted to doing this, um, um, uh, uh, doing the optimization of the capture list at Julia optimized time. You can do it at LVM time too. So um, Enzyme, for example, could plug into um, into the same mechanism um, to have something uh, have a representation of its delayed state. Uh, at um, at lowering time, but there's there's a number of other um, applications of this. So uh, tasking um, Takafumi has been doing a lot of work on um, trying to integrate uh, Tapia, which is a, a parallel uh, task runtime and optimization framework out of um, out of MIT, and he's been doing some experiments and using opaque closures there because it has a similar problem, where you know how you have the function that creates a task and the function that runs the task, and you sort of want to optimize across them. And then there's a, uh, there's a few others um, that um, might use it, but I wanted to highlight this as a development because it's, it's kind of cool. It's, it's sort of a new kind of object in the Julia language, which I think we haven't had in, a, in some time. You know, it's a sort of cool new core capability of the language. So I wanted to highlight it. Uh, OK, and then, nope. Why are the slides jumping out? Sorry about that. All right. Um, and then what I think will actually be the answer uh, to this uh, composability question is um, uh, is uh, something that we're calling compiler plugins. And that is literally like right this second, there's a PR on GitHub right now uh, that you can look at being designed. And uh, again, Shuhei is, is, is leading um, the charge on this, um, along with a few other people, um, McCoy, has, uh, McCoy Becker has been uh, quite involved in uh, trying to figure out what this means. And obviously, the rest of the compiler team, Jeff and Jameson, 
and myself are, um, have also been deeply involved in, in, in trying to um, <coughs> uh, trying to figure out. Uh, uh, sorry, my <coughs> cough is uh, coming back. Uh, uh, trying to figure out uh, what the semantics of this are, but basically the plan is that we would like to have several uh, well-defined high-level interfaces for various kinds of compiler plugins. So whether it's a cassette-like thing, whether it's a you know an inference plugin, an optimizer plugin, and plugin at the LLVM level, just have like stable high-level interfaces um, that are composable and let people build all these um, various kinds of optimizations. And that's going on right now. And I think this is something to keep an eye on. I think this will really, I, mean, I hope it will really solve this challenge that I said at the beginning of how do we compose uh, these various kinds of compiler methods. Okay, and you know, I, why are we, you know, what's sort of driving all this motivation in um, uh, all this work in compilers? Um, I, I think we'd be remiss not to mention AD. Um, I think AD has become a hugely important foundational capability, really, in much of the ecosystem. Um, it sits on um, uh, it, it sits underneath all of the SIML stack, Flex stack, Turing stack, you know. All of the major, major ecosystems in the Julia world are heavily relying on AD. <coughs> uh, so we're trying to, uh, uh, we're really trying to push uh, towards a production grade AD system. Uh, there are several people working um, uh, towards this. Uh, you saw the Chain Wolves talk yesterday. Um, that's been an enormous amount of work, and I think it's really turned out well um, to uh, really have a well tested. Uh, Set of rules for AD. You know, it's one thing to have a bunch of rules, but really, the the effort that's gone into figuring out um, how to make these rules work and and to test them well. Um, you know, Linda and Misha and uh, everybody who's been working on that. You know, it, it's been an enormous amount of effort. So that that's really cool. Um, Enzyme uh, is really cool. So uh, Valentin and and Billy have been working on that, and you probably saw the talk yesterday. I think that's a very cool development. Uh, as I mentioned, I hope it can plug into uh, some of the work we've been doing with opaque closures and diffractor, um, since it sort of solves orthogonal challenges. Diffractor sort of solves the challenge of how you do AD in the presence of incomplete information, uh, whereas um, Enzyme is really good at you know what's the best possible AD you can do given complete information. So hopefully we can put them together and get the best possible AD whether you have complete information or not. Um, and with that, uh, that's all I wanted to highlight. So I'm uh, going to turn it over. Thanks, Keno. That was that was wonderful. And I'm going to take a few minutes to cover some of the linear algebra side of things. Um, so there we go. All right. So my my section here is going to sort of be a roadmap of all the other talks that you should be watching uh, at JuliaCon. And uh, you know, as as many of you know, linear algebra software is one of my favorite topics. And uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about it. There is no way I can do justice to all of the work that everyone has done uh, in making our, our linear algebra stack as good as it is. Um, but we also have a lot more work to be done. So the first uh, thing that is worth announcing is uh, is that Julia 1.7 is going to ship with uh, LibBlast trampoline. Uh, it, it uses PLT trampolines designed by uh, Elliot. Uh, and uh, this allows us to switch BLAS and LAPAC libraries at runtime. Essentially, it's, it's actually pretty cool. You can actually switch them even while Julia is running and go back and forth if you wanted to, but I would not uh, encourage you to do that. Um, there's a talk by Elliot uh, and Mose about uh, how all of this works, so I would encourage you to go check it out. Uh, the times are all weird out here. They're in UTC, so make sure it, you, you see the times in your own time zones. Um, and I, I really think that LibBlast Trampoline is going to be one of those projects that many other um, open source and proprietary scientific software systems are going to incorporate uh, from, from what we've uh, done in the Julia world. It's the only one that works on all the operating systems. However, the bigger question is, you know, when when is a native Julia Blas really going to come along? And Chris Elrod is going to talk about it with, all, you know, and, and there are a number of projects uh, that are making progress towards it, you know, Octavian, recursive factorization, um, and, and there's at least a couple of others. Um, and, and Chris is going to cover all of that in his talk uh, today. Um, 
along with, so the question is, you know, while we have all these amazing things with Lib Blast Trampoline, we really do need native Julia implementations to go much further. You know, why do we need to do that? We need to play nice with AD. We need to be multi-threaded. We need to be, you know, running on GPUs. We have, we have just so much more to do. And then there's a deeper question around, well, there's a lot of thought being put into the Blast side of things. What happens on replacing the LA pack side of things? And, and there, are, there are many ideas uh, that have been thrown around uh, over the years, but it may be time to sort of start, uh, start making some progress towards those. Um, of course, the Julia Linear Algebra organization has a ton of other um, you know, linear algebra packages that are not part of standard library. And there's a question about where should the lines be and should more things move out of standard libraries. Uh, yet another uh, topic that keeps coming up a lot is the future of sparse, sparse matrix capabilities in STD libs. And, and I, I personally, along with many others, believe that having shipped a particular sparse matrix implementation in the standard library has in some ways uh, prevented a lot of the other ecosystem uh, improvements around sparse matrix capabilities, like trying out you know, new containers and, uh, and, and, and moving these things really fast. Uh, you know, there's, we, we already have so many different array classes for, for representing dense and other kinds of uh, you know, structured matrices. Sparse matrices themselves are a big class of, uh, of matrices that you can have in, in terms of how you represent the sparsity and how you benefit from it. In fact, uh, the talk that is right after us uh, by Dr. Sherry Lee um, uh, you know, from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory will be around uh, many of these kinds of things. And, and I would highly encourage you guys to, to pay attention to that. But the question is, if you want to do more of that, we do need to, uh, to decouple more of the Julia sparse matrix capabilities from the standard library. Maybe we need to move it out into its own repo. Maybe we need to move it out of standard libraries. Maybe we need to wait for 2.0 until we can do this sort of a thing. This is an ongoing discussion. It's going to sort of take up more steam. But uh, we've already started down this journey. SweetSparse.jl has been split out into its own repo, even though it ships in the Julia standard libraries. But uh, there's, there's more work to be done there. Um, Will Kemmerer's got a talk about sweet, scar, sweet sparse graph blast .jl, which is wrapping Tim Davis's uh, graph blast library. And uh, it provides a lot of underlying implementation, a, a very new and interesting and modern sparse matrix implementation that could potentially be uh, something that we might want to make more first class. So listen, listen to Will uh, in his talk uh, later today um, and, and how this might be potentially one path forward but uh, there, there's there's a lot of um, work around abstractions and how we structure things in order to uh, to get this right. Talking about uh, just uh, you know talking about that you know we, we need yet more flexibility in our linear algebra stack. Uh, we already like I pointed out have dense matrices, sparse matrices, diagonals, bidiagonals, tridiagonals, symmetric tridiagonals. There are packages that have things like block banded mat matrices. And, and, and there are many more things. There's, it's just not even possible to name all of these things anymore. But we want our linear algebra to be fully generic, fully AD compatible, run on all the GPUs and all the weird hardware that comes out and be distributed and multi-threaded and, and, and everything else. And uh, we want this all to work on big as well as small linear algebra. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done and we barely got started. Julia with the compiler and the library ecosystem has got us to a stage where we can now start asking these questions and, and, and actually start, uh, start uh, addressing them. Um, and of course that asks, that begs even more questions about how should things be structured? Because when things are in the base and the standard library, the, you know, they have to necessarily move slower. There are, uh, you know, there are speed limits on, on how fast you can contribute code because of uh, all the careful, uh, uh, you know, about, because you have to be really careful about how you go about doing it, and uh, and and there is a there is a balance to be struck here between stability and and speed of movement, or can you have both? Can you have the old APIs that are stable and and new new types and new APIs uh, that can move faster? So so a lot of work and thought process there. And uh, oops, uh, what I what I meant to say was uh, there was a, a BOF session yesterday uh, that was uh, run by. I believe Lyndon and um, uh, you know Lyndon and one of his colleagues, and uh, this we, we are looking forward to getting some of these uh, notes out and putting them uh, either into a blog post or a discourse. That would be sort of an interesting start for some of this conversation. But uh, 
looking forward to discussing this with uh, everyone else. And with that, I will hand over to Stefan to talk about the package ecosystem. Yeah, so uh, it's been a big year in the package ecosystem. I I, no I noticed recently more and more um, announcements of 1.0 releases of packages. Um, and so I, I went through, did a little bit of uh, you know, scraping of the uh, the Git history of the general registry. Uh, and these were some of the packages that I found in the past since January 2020 that went 1.0. Um, just the ones that stuck out at me. It's a bit of a sub subject subjective list. But um, uh, an, an interesting feature here, I think, is, you know, that we, we, we've been strong at math stuff in Julia for a long time. Um, the data data analysis capabilities have been a little bit further behind. I think it's a very hard area to to tackle and solve, but um, the the data capabilities in the ecosystem are really, really maturing. So especially, you know, data frames hitting 1.0, uh, CSV is about to hit 1.0. Um, all of these data IO uh, packages. Um, and, and one interesting thing to note here is that Jacob Quinn is responsible for like, a lot of these, a fairly large number. Um, he's also very good at communicating when he's going to 1.0. So if you go to Discourse and search for 1.0 release, you get a lot of Jacob Quinn posting that he, uh, you know, has released the 1.0 version of one of these, you know, critical data data science packages. Um, also, other other useful packages I noticed, you know, lots of interesting and useful utilities that that people depend on. Web stuff is getting more mature. Um, random stuff, the CUDA ecosystem, you know, I don't know where to put that in. It's, is it mathematical? Is it utilities? But uh, that was all release 1.0. Um, and of course, upcoming CSV. I saw there was a, an announcement on, on about Javis, the Javis package, which is really cool. Um, Jacob. Um, Jacob announced that he was, you know, looking, looking to get feedback on going to 1.0 with that. Um, and the thing that really struck me about it is that we've sort of developed a culture in the community of having a roadmap and process for big packages reaching 1.0 and getting feedback from people and then doing a stabilization process. Um, and I, I think that's a really healthy and great um, tendency in the in the in the community. Um, I was kind of curious if we were in a, a Cambrian explosion of 1.0 releases, so I I did some. You know, data sleuthing, and um, so this is the, the the fraction of registered packages that are at greater than or equal to 1.0 um, out of the total number of registered packages uh, at the time, and then across the y-axis is uh, starting from when I have data, which is sometime in 2018, to the present day, and you can see the Ju Julia cons are um, are marked with uh, with verticals. Um, and actually, uh, we've plateaued a bit. Um, we're sort of asymptotically approaching a quarter of the ecosystem. A lot of that is because new packages keep getting added. So this is, I think, a lot of high-profile pro mature packages are really, you know, like the ones I just listed are are going to 1.0. But then people keep adding new packages, so the fraction um, seems to be about stable at at 25%. Um, I actually probably should have given this this part of the talk last year. It turns out we were in uh, this this steep section up here where um, a lot of packages went 1.0 last year. Um, I just specifically, I want to drill into some of the great things in the data ecosystem. Um, this is a Jacob Quinn uh, joint CSV.jl. Um, CSV parsing is this horribly underspecified, complicated problem that we've inflicted on ourselves as a as a as a discipline, there's no reason for this, but unfortunately, it's a thing we have to do, and everyone who does data science needs to get good at it. Um, so the the great thing here is that the CSV.jl is not only you know the most flexible and reliable, one of the most flexible and reliable CSV parsers around now. It's also one of the fastest, um, and you know this these are some benchmarks from a blog post we published earlier in the year showing that it you know. The multi-threaded uh, <clears throat> CSV parser is is just really fast. Um, data frames is also is is has also gone 1.0, which is exciting. But also that means that now all the developers are free to um, to spend more time worrying about the performance. And so now the performance of a lot of fundamental operations has gotten really fast. Um, here you see an example where it's uh, 
I think this is a group buy um, on a moderate amount of data, five gigabytes, and it's the you know the fastest thing around compared to all these other data frame implementations. Um, but there's still work to be done. Uh, there's a lot of um, you know there's other other operations like I think this is a a join operation on a moderate amount of data and data frames is you know doing it's middle of the pack. But you know there's other there's other implementations that are really kicking butt here, and we would like to also be in the kicking butt category. Um, so that's it. Just uh, um, I think we should probably move on to questions, but I wanted to highlight some of the great things that are happening in the package ecosystem. Thank you, everyone, for sharing the amazing developments in Julia. Uh, we will now take a few questions from the audience. The first one is, what is the roadmap or timeline for separate compilation? So I, we don't have a specific deadline for that, but I was thinking about it. And I think my personal goal, I guess, just for, for my side, my personal goal would be to present like a prototype next year. I'd like to be able to do that at least. All right. All right. The next one is on conditional dependencies. What is the plan around that? And what can the community do to help you? So we, we've actually had a tentative plan for a couple of years now. Um, we just haven't gotten around to actually implementing it. Um, so given that, that, that feels to me like one of the pieces of the package puzzle that is really lagging and that we really should address. Um, you know, requires does a good job, but it's a little bit of a hack um, and it causes problems with pre-compilation um, and it causes issues with dependencies not being explicitly declared in project files. So we really should solve the the um, conditional dependency issue. I, I think that would be a good thing to tackle in the in the coming year. OK, the next one. How much faster can we make the Julia interpreter and how hard will it be? Uh, so I, that's a piece of low hanging fruit. Actually, we have put about zero effort into that. Um, currently, the interpreter is about 50 to 500 times slower than compiled code. Uh, so I think there's a easily a factor of 10 available there. Uh, right now, it's just a very simple, slow, as you can imagine, interpreter. Uh, so just doing something very straightforward, like uh, converting it to a, a bytecode interpreter, uh, would probably have a huge impact. So yeah, I think there's a factor of 10 available there. I have, I have a follow up on that, Jeff. Um, would that matter? Like, how how important do you think the uh, interpreter being faster would be? So right now, it would not really affect anyone, which is why we haven't done it because we hardly ever run anything in the interpreter. Uh, but what it would let us do is use the interpreter more often instead of compiling code, uh, which would avoid compilation overhead. Uh, so that would be the eventual goal. All right. Thanks again, everyone. We need to stick to the schedule here. The audience can interact more on Discord. 